Okay, so thank you for the invitation. And I'm going to so present a work uh, we did a few years ago with, uh, with uh, Hubert uh, Lacoin and, and Rémy. Um, and uh, on the, the semi-classical limit of Uville uh, conformal field theory. Uh, so I thought it was appropriate because we already had a, in your, in, in your seminar, there was lectures by, by Yilin on, on semi-classical limits. So they're becoming a, a topic that people I think uh, who are attending this seminar are interested in. Uh, and um, so let me, let me uh, jump right into the, oh, it doesn't want to, okay. <clears throat> so um, this was just a slide uh, to remind a bit what was going on uh, around the Liouville or Liouville quantum gravity, Liouville field theory, whatever. Uh, uh, anyways, I'll be working on the Riemann sphere. So uh, all this is equivalent. And so, of course, uh, there's a huge program which is devoted to, to showing that the scaling limit of planar maps is uh, described by uh, Liouville quantum gravity, which I summarized here in the way we uh, introduced uh, we introduced Liouville quantum gravity a few years ago by making sense of this path integral. And uh, there's also this uh, the way um, that Jason, Jason Miller, uh, Scott Sheffield, and Bertrand Duplantier introduced Liouville quantum gravity, but uh, not based on the path integral. But now we know that, OK, there's a bijection between both approaches. And so uh, there's a, a whole uh, people, a whole team of people working on this program here. And uh, you heard a talk by uh, Remy, I think, a week or two ago and the seminar explaining our program, which is to relate the, this path integral to, um, to the so-called conformal bootstrap approach, which is popular in physics. Now, today, I'm going to explain something which uh, intuitively is kind of, I mean, obvious, uh, is, 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 is how you can recover uh, constant curvature metrics uh, when, when, you, uh, when you take the appropriate scaling limit of, of your path integral. So roughly, when gamma goes to zero, you make the randomness go to zero in your system. Uh, and, and you should recover what is a classical geometry. And uh, OK, since we work with marked points, what is classical geometry? It's just a, a constant negative curvature uh, metrics. OK, so let me first explain the history behind, um, behind this. Uh, this semi-classical limit I'm going to discuss uh, uh, in this talk. So um, let me start with uh, uh, where this, uh, by uh, a question which was uh, held at, by the Royal Society of Science in Göttingen in 1890. So it was, uh, uh, this, this, this in, in 1890, uh, recall this was a time which was very, um, uh, where there was lots of active research by, by many people among, uh, among whom uh, Henri Poincaré were looking to, uh, were trying to, to prove the uniformization theorem of, of Riemann surfaces. And uh, associated to this problem, there's a, the constant negative curvature uh, metric problem, which was, uh, which was asked by uh, the Royal Society. And so what is this question? So you, you take, uh, what is it about? You take the, the Riemann sphere or the complex plane with a point at infinity, you take uh, marked points, zi, and weights, chi, uh, chi i is showed, associated to each marked point on the complex plane, and you suppose that chi i is strictly smaller than two. Okay, and the question is, does there exist, and there is, is there existence and unicity of a function phi star, which uh, so satisfies uh, the following asymptotic as z goes to infinity, so equivalent to minus four log z. This is because we're constructing a, a metric on the Riemann sphere, in fact, by taking the exponential. So this is where this condition comes from, which is a constant negative curvature uh, with curvature of minus two pi lambda. So saying that exponential phi star has a a constant negative curvature minus two pi lambda, it's equivalent to solving that the standard Laplacian, uh, okay, regular standard Laplacian in the flat metric is equal to two pi exponential phi. So this is for the points which are outside your marked points. And at the marked points, you want 
the metric exponential phi start to have conical singularities, meaning that around the point, each point zi, phi star is uh, equal to chi i log one over z minus zi. And so this question was actually settled the year that, um, the year it was, um, it was, uh, it was given. So let me just first make a remark that there's a relation. If you want to have uh, existence and unicity to this equation, uh, you see that uh, since lambda is positive, by doing gauss bonnet if such a function exists, you get this relation. So you need to ensure one condition. You need that the sum of the chi i's is, are small. Or Sorry. Uh, Excuse me? I'm so so uh, I think your slide is not changing, uh, is it? Ah. Intentional or is, uh, yeah. So, so I think you are doing a really, uh, really good job without changing slides, but <laughs> probably you want to change it. You don't see my, you don't see my slide changing here? No, 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 no. Uh, maybe you can. It's okay, not moving. Now, now, now it's uh, moving. You yeah, see yeah. it now? Now it's moving, yeah. You see it moving? Yeah, yeah, now, now it's moving now. So let's yeah. just keep it this way because it's working. Okay, okay, sure. It's probably so it, it's, the don't get my messy, my messy screen, screen yeah. uh, but uh, okay. Yeah. But so, I think I still uh, follow the first uh, five minutes, so I, I think it's fine. Okay, and so so uh, so anyways, uh, I just said that you you have necessarily this relation by using a gauss bonnet theorem on the Riemann sphere, and so if you want to have existence and unicity to this equation, you need that the sum of the weights you put at the different points, you know, the conical singularity. They have to add up and they have to be bigger than four. So this ensures that one half sum is bigger than two. And so this was proved uh, the same year it was asked by the Royal Society by, by Emile Picard. And so uh, uh, he showed the uh, existence unicity to this, this equation. Okay, and so what, what, we, what we would call classical conformal invariance in this context is that if the solution depends of course on the marked points. And if you take a Mebus transform, you can see that uh, the way the, the solution moves, when you move the marked points uh, is given by this relation, okay, which is a, a relation you get. If you take the exponential, what you're saying is that the exponential is a metric. Or, or if you take any alpha, you're saying that you have, some, you have, a, you have a conformal weight when you move the points uh, according to this, uh, to this rule. And, uh, and so we would cover the volume form for alpha equals one. Okay, so this is uh, the classical conformal invariance. And, and, and then we know, I mean, we've seen uh, in tons of talks by either, uh, you know, uh, Scott, uh, Jason and all Bertrand uh, on their side or on our side, we, see, we, we know that when we construct a Liouville field, it's going to have a quantum, it's going to satisfy a quantum version of this, of this relation. Okay, so, um, so here comes Poincaré, which is an interesting story, is that uh, Poincaré, he wanted to uh, uniformize the, the Riemann sphere where you take out these points ZI. And so he introduced what is called the classical energy tensor. So if you take the solution to this uh, equation I gave you, so Laplacian equals constant times exponential, it's very easy to see that outside of the marked points, uh, this is a holomorphic function, okay? I mean, if you, it's a simple exercise uh, to show this. And so he introduced this uh, holomorphic observable. And if, since you're working on the Riemann sphere, uh, you just have to look at uh, the, how the function looks along the singularities. And uh, you can deduce from that, that uh, this classical uh, holomorphic, uh, okay, meromorphic function, because it has the singularities, it's necessarily of the form uh, that I wrote here. Okay, so this is just, if you, this is seen, this is what you get when you look at what happens when Z goes to ZK. It has a singularity of order two. And so it's going to have also some kind of AK uh, over the singularity of order one when Z approaches Z, Z, ZK. Okay. And, and these AKs are called accessory parameters. And what, and what Poincaré did and, um, is that he, he, didn't, he didn't used the, the stress uh, what is called the classical stress tensor to solve a Fuchsian equation. And, uh, uh, and if you take two independent solutions, you can show that this constant negative curvature metric is the pullback of, uh, of a function which goes in the disk. So it's a, 
it's a it's a fun, it's a multi-valued function in the disk huh? it, because there's monodromy uh, issues when you solve this friction equation. But this is what uh, one could call a uniformization theorem. I mean, he 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 realizes the constant negative curvature metric on the sphere with with points that you take out as a, a pullback of a, of a metric in the disk, essentially. Okay, and one thing you can see, and it's going to play a, a role, is you can see that um, exponential minus phi star over two solves uh, this uh, partial differential equation here. So you can, uh, this is something you can, you can actually see uh, uh, directly. Um, just by, 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 by taking derivatives and using the fact that Laplace equals exponential, et cetera. So this is kind of a, a, a 10 minute uh, crash course on, on, on the uniformization theorems that, that were around in, in, in the nineties. And then all this kind of disappeared from, I mean, uh, from research uh, say in mathematics. Uh, and it was kind of revived uh, 80 years later when, when, by Polyakov and, and, and what did um, Polyakov do so let me uh, first explain for those uh, who, 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 don't, who haven't seen this already. So in 81, Polyakov introduced uh, what is, uh, you know, his, his famous uh, path integral approach to, to bosonic string theory. And so essentially he put a metric on the space of metrics on a surface. And this distance, I, I think it's called the DeWitt, met DeWitt metric uh, in mathematics. It's kind of the, the most obvious metric, uh, L2 metric you're going to put on the space of metrics. And it says that the distance between G, a metric and, and, and a G plus a, a, a small, uh, small element is given by essentially the, tr the trace of, uh, of the square of the difference uh, that you integrate on, on, on your Riemann surface. Okay, so it's the, the qu standard quadratic uh, uh, metric. And he argued, so this is something which is still a bit uh, under debate, but uh, he argued that if you take this, if you look at the volume form uh, associated to this metric on the space of metrics, it should uh, factorize into three parts. It should factorize into uh, a volume form on, so you can write each metric as the pullback by, sorry, by the, it's, you can write each metric on your Riemann surface it's, it's parametrized by three things, uh, the diffeomorphism morphism group, uh, the, conform, the, the space of functions, the conformal factors, and uh, what is called moduli space, which is, um, uh, which is parametrized by, uh, it, which is a finite dimensional space. So you have a, a finite dimensional space which of reference metrics, so typically the, the constant negative curvature metrics, you multiply by exponential conformal factor, you take the pullback by a diffeomorphism and you'll get all the metrics you can put on, on your Riemann surface. Um, and he argued, so that's what I call Polyakov's discovery. He argued that you could kind of, you know, there's kind of a polar decomposition on the space of metrics and it factorizes into uh, a volume form on the diffeomorphism group times uh, a volume form on the space of conformal factors times, uh, the uh, volume form on, on, the, on the space of, on moduli space. And uh, what he argued is that the volume form is described by Uville conformal field theory uh, for the conformal factor. And that this Uville conformal field theory is really the quantum version of the Uville uh, equation that I discussed a, a few slides before. Okay, so let me try to explain what Polyakov did and how he, he recovered these, these uh, uh, these accessory parameters of, of Poincaré. So what he did is he, he introduced Uville. So what is Uville uh, heuristically in the path integral approach? Roughly, it's, so it's, the, uh, it's described by a path integral. So you take a volume form on the space of functions, d phi, and you multiply by exponential minus uh, the Uville action. And what is the Uville action? It, is, uh, it depends on two parameters, gamma and mu positive. And it's roughly a gradient square term plus uh, an interaction, an exponential interaction term. Uh, and so you need to take mu positive for this interaction term to, to exist. If mu equals zero, it's just Gaussian free field theory, but it's where Uville field theory is, is not Gaussian free field theory. So 
the action is a, a gradient squared term plus an exponential interaction. And you have to integrate on the space of functions which satisfy this condition when z goes to infinity. It's the roughly equal to the equivalent to minus two q log z and q is given by this, uh, uh, this formula to ensure conformal invariance and q is given by two over gamma plus gamma over two. So it, it depends essentially, it's so it actually it depends only on two parameters, gamma and mu. Okay, and you see, of course, uh, why is this the quantum version of this, uh, uh, of this equation I, I said in the first uh, uh, slide? Uh, is that, of course, if you want to minimize your action, uh, you're going to find that the minimum is going to satisfy Laplacian of phi equals exponential phi, okay? So essentially, that's why it's a quantum version. If you take the minimum, you, you get the class, what is called the, the classical solution. And then if you use, you say that the classical solution, you, it's the minimum of an action. And then you use this action in a Gibbs, uh, Gibbs way to construct a, a path integral, just like you do in quantum mechanics. When you, when you have this Feynman path integral, you, 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 you see that uh, you use a, an action whose minimum is given in by the, the the, the, will describe the, 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 the way a classical particle will, will move in a potential. Okay, and so uh, heuristically what Polyakov did is that he, he wanted to recover uh, so the, the classical framework. So what he did is that, so he scaled mu as lambda over gamma square, okay? And so now lambda is fixed and you take, you take the correlations uh, with at points zi here. So nothing is defined. Uh, I mean, this is how physicists do it, but at the end it works, but I'm explaining heuristically how we were going to recover this classical, so this classical story I described in the first, the first few slides during 10 minutes. So what you do is you look at the field gamma phi and you look at, uh, so you can integrate say a, a, a function of gamma phi product of uh, exponential alpha i phi taken at points zi, and you scale alpha i as chi i over gamma. So chi i is fixed, lambda is fixed, and you, you take mu equal lambda over gamma square, and you see that you can write this action, uh, this, this thing is equivalent to this, where this time your action is nothing but, so exponential minus one over gamma square, and here the s prime is the gradient square plus cat, four pi over a uh, lambda minus uh, sum of uh, chi i u of zi, okay? Now, if you, if you do, uh, uh, so it's now, now you see that if you take this thing here and you take the minimum, uh, uh, say, it's going to be minimized by something which is supposed to solve Laplacian phi star equals two pi exponential phi star minus uh, two pi sum of Dirac masses in ZE times chi i, which is nothing but the equation I gave you uh, in the first slide, okay? But when I'm doing that, okay, I'm kind of cheating when I look at this minimum here because uh, typically, I mean, the function is not going to be defined at ZI because it, it has singularities. But let's not, as I said, it's a bit of a sloppy derivation. So of course, when gamma goes to zero, you see that, okay, if I apply some kind of Laplace method uh, or, or large deviation principle, uh, you know, kind of a Varadon lemma on this path integral, since gamma is going to zero, gamma phi is gonna concentrate on the minimum of the action. And formally the minimum of the action is, 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 is solves this solution. Uh, and, and, and therefore you see that this path integral is going to be equivalent to F taken at phi star. So the, the solution of the constant negative metric, uh, the constant negative curvature metric times exponential minus one over gamma square, the action taken at its minimum, okay? So of course, as I said, I, I was a bit, I'm a bit cheating because you see uh, S, S prime here that I, that, I, that I wrote here is not really defined because uh, the space of, of where, I, where I live, where this path integral is gonna live 
there, there are logarithmic singularities, but never mind. I'll give you a clean definition of this S prime in a, in a few slides. And, that you, and you see at the end that, okay, you should have this kind of, if, you, if your path integral exists, it should have this kind of behavior here. And then take F equals exponential gamma minus gamma over two five Z. This is, we know that it satisfies the so-called BPZ equation, which is uh, this thing here. So this we, it's expected in conformal field theory, and, and we proved it actually with Anti and Remy, that th these special correlations verify uh, degenerate uh, equations. Uh, and so if you now take uh, where, if you now take the, the gamma equal zero limit of these correlations, you get that it's, they should be equivalent according to my heuristic to this thing over here. And so if you insert it into BPC, you see that uh, you get that the, the solution of a uh, phi star of my constant uh, curvature metric negative uh, should satisfy this partial differential equation. Where this time, well, since I'm taking differentials of, of, of these kinds of quantities, I actually get a, um, uh, a concrete, or I don't know if it's concrete, but an explicit relation for these accessory parameters. And so Polyakov, uh, you know, he, he wrote his path integral and he, he went to the semi-classical limit exactly as I'm explaining to you right now. And he recovered uh, the, the fundamental partial differential equation satisfied by, by my, 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 my metric, my, 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 my conformal factor phi star. And he, ha and he added a, a new input is actually he gave a characterization of, of, of these AKs which, which appear in the, the classical stress energy tensor, which, which is used to uniformize my, my surface with points, with marked points, okay? And so uh, the question, okay, in some sense, what I just described to you in a completely heuristic way as Polyakov did it, can one make this picture rigorous using probability theory? So, and the answer is of course, yes. That's what we did with, um, with Hubert and, and Rémy. Uh, you know, based on the work with uh, with François David and 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 uh, and Anti, where where we where we introduced a rigorous version of this path integral that uh, that Polyakov was playing with. Okay, um, so now I'm going to explain uh, the results we get, and then I'll finish with open problems that we didn't treat, and I think it would be interesting that uh, I don't know someone in in the audience or or, or maybe. Uh, someone else settles, I think it's something doable, but it's doesn't, it doesn't enter our framework exactly. So I'll, I'll state the open problems at the end. Okay, so remember, so now I'm going to give a rigorous version of all this, this, this story I, 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 I talked about. So, so remember now, uh, so in, in, in all this talk, um, I'm going to replace mu by lambda the cosmological constant by lambda over gamma square with lambda fixed, okay? And so uh, remember that I want to integrate with respect to exponential minus the Liouville action, a function of phi and the, a product of exponential of the, the, the field phi taken at different points. Okay, and so to make a long story uh, very short, uh, so what we did in 2014 with uh, François David and, and Antti Kupkinen, sorry, is that we gave a definition for this thing. And the definition is that it's uh, proportional up to some constant to, to the following thing. So first let's, let's forget about Z zero. So the rigorous definition of this, of this uh, quantity is the average with respect to a Gaussian free field X. So phi is a Gaussian free field X uh, with the green function, say the standard green function on the sphere. So, uh, so we see X is the Gaussian free field with average zero res with respect to the round metric on the, on the sphere. Plus, so uh, since phi is a tensor, I have to add, so I have to add, so gamma phi, I'm looking at gamma phi, I have to add gamma Q over two log G. So log G is nothing but uh, this thing here. So it's explicit. It, it, it prescribes the behavior of my, of the Liouville field when Z goes to infinity. And so, and I also have um, to add uh, to my Gaussian free field, I also have to add 
a sum of logarithmic singularities with weight chi i. Okay, so uh, it's a function of the Gaussian free field plus this uh, this thing uh, this explicit factor plus some uh, i equal one to n chi i and the green function taken at a point z and at point z i. So this creates the logarithmic singularities around the point z i plus uh, the log of a, of a random variable, which is distributed according to the, the gamma distribution, which is written here. So it's an explicit density minus log zero. And I reweight my probability space by a power, a certain power of Z zero. And what is Z zero? Z zero is, is, is in some sense, the, it's, it's the complete area of my, uh, of my the exponential of the Gaussian free field with the logarithmic singularity. So it, I, if I integrate the exponential of the Gaussian free field with these logarithmic singularities around the point zi, if I integrate it on my manifold on, on the Riemann sphere, I get some total mass at zero and I have to reweight by this total mass uh, to get my, 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 the distribution of my Newville field uh, uh, in, in, in this quantity. So essentially uh, when you, the, when you want uh, the take home message is that when I put conical sync, when I look at a function of my Newville field times the product of these exponential here, here, well, the rigorous probabilistic definition of this, it's nothing but a Gaussian free field with logarithmic singularities at the point zi, and I reweight total space according to, to this factor z0. Okay, and so if I want to recover my semi-classical limit. Now I have a clean definition. I have to try to understand uh, what happens when in this thing here, which is completely okay, well-defined probabilistically, uh, when gamma goes to zero. Now, I'm sorry because it may be a bit quick, fast for people who are not familiar with this, but okay, by now I think most of, of you in the audience know uh, that defining exponential of the free field is it's not completely straightforward uh, because uh, the free field is not defined pointwise. And so uh, you, when I write this as a formal notation and the rigorous definition is actually, uh, well, it was done by, by lots of people uh, among whom uh, Mandelbrot, Hakon, uh, Kahan, I mean, it was revisited lots of times and it, 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 to define the exponential of the free field. Uh, and so to define Z zero, uh, you regularize your Gaussian free field and you take out a, a, a counter term, which enables to, the, to get a finite and well-defined uh, quantity. And actually, we now know even how to renormalize uh, not just the area of the exponential of the free field, but also, you know, distance functions, et cetera. So this was, uh, uh, this, this was a, uh, the conclusion of a series of work, recent works uh, by, by lots of people among who, uh, so there's Ewan, uh, uh, with Jason, who, who showed um, the, the existence unicity of the metric at the end, um, based on okay, lots of lots of work uh, by by Ding Falcone, Dubeda, etc. Um, okay, so um, so here's a clean statement. So now what I do is that so I, I define I define my 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 probability measure. So uh, it's nothing but uh, what I I defined on on the previous slide. So I I I, I look at Say a function of the field, and and I reweight by the product of the exponential, and I divide by the product of the exponential, the correlation function. So I get a good probability measure. And okay, if we assume that the Seiberg bounds, so what does that mean? If you I, if I assume that sum of the chi i's is bigger than four, okay, so I recover the uh, what uh, what I had in the first uh, in the first uh, slide on the classical framework. So suppose that sum of the chi i's is bigger than four. And, and let gamma go to zero, then uh, I get the following. The field gamma phi under this probability measure, which is so described by my, my, my Gaussian free field with log logarithmic singularities, reweighted by, by this, the exponential of the Gaussian free field to some power, then the field converges in probability towards phi star, so the, the, the constant uh, negative curvature metric, and moreover, the field, if I take, if I, if I, I have a central limit theorem, if I take out minus one over gamma phi star, this converges in distribution towards a massive Gaussian free field, 
with mass given by the sum of the chi minus four, which is positive. And, and I take this massive Gaussian free field, it's, it's uh, in the background metric uh, of the constant curvature uh, metric, plus uh, it converges to that, plus an independent uh, uh, Gaussian variable, which has this variance here, which essentially, okay, this, this constant, uh, this constant uh, random variable, uh, this this global uh, Gaussian mode, it, it actually comes out of the limit of, of, of the, the density chi here, this log chi term here creates a, a Gaussian variable in the limit. Okay, so we're able to recover uh, the fact that, that okay, we're happy, we, we recover the, what it seems kind of obvious is that we, we can recover the classical framework when we work in the quantum framework and we make the randomness of the quantum framework go to zero. And now I'm going to talk about the large deviation principle, which is what I really talked about with uh, when I, 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 I described what Polyakov uh, did in a realistic manner. So I, I introduced uh, the Uville action. So remember that, so I'm going to look at fields which have logarithmic singularities at the point ZK. Now, if I, I int so what I do is that I, I take gradient of the function square plus the interact, the exponential, but I integrate outside of, so plus infinity and a little balls around ZK, okay? Where the function is going to be smooth. I look at minus four, pi, four pi sum of chi K, the function taken at ZK, but the function is regularized. So it's, you take a circle average of the function around the point ZK and you take out the logarithmic, the, the logarithmic sorry, divergency with these factors here, okay? Now, if you do that and you go to the limit, you get something which is meaningful when you have a smooth function, which has a log cigarette, logarithmic singularities around the point ZK um, with a weight chi K. So you can show that this is, this converges if you take such functions. And uh, what we did is we showed that, so this is a rigorous definition of this, this action that I, I wrote. Uh, uh, and so if the sum of the chi k's is bigger than four, which is the Seiberg bounds, uh, or in the classical uh, framework, it's just saying that I'm working with a, a negative curvature metric, then the field gamma phi satisfies the large deviation principle with speed uh, gamma square and rate function S of phi took, taken minus its infimum, which is obtained on the negative curvature metric. And so uh, this converge. Sorry, there's a typo here because here it's not one over gamma square log probability converges, it's gamma square log probability. So uh, here one must replace one over gamma square by gamma square, okay? So uh, the probability is going to zero and then, uh, and so the log is going to infinity and uh, essentially, uh, and, so, uh, and so here I have to multiply by gamma square to get something meaningful. So sorry, there's a typo, this is gamma square, not one over gamma square. Okay, and so for an appropriate subset of, of the type H, H minus one, remember gamma phi is, is, is Locally, at least, it looks like a Gaussian free field plus log singularities. So, if I take a, a functions which are uh, which are the of the form uh, which which are of the form uh, which live in a space h minus one say or h minus epsilon, a negative Sob Sobolev space plus log singularities uh, with appropriate weights at the points at k. Uh, I, that's that's where my 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 quantum Newville field, which converges to the classical solution, is living. Okay, so we can recover all this. And, and, and uh, since we proved uh, the BPZ differential equation for the field exponential minus gamma over two phi Z uh, in our paper with Antti and Remy, uh, we showed that our probabilistic construction, we can recover these uh, uh, degenerate equations. <clears throat> well, we, we can also give a, a, a probabilistic proof of, of, um, of Polyakov's relation for these accessory parameters. And, but, uh, okay, so this was, it was kind of sad. And what was satis I mean, what was nice with this is that we actually showed that from the quantum, we could derive the classical relations, but okay. Uh, 
but you've seen many instances of, of, of rather uh, nice and, and impressive uh, instances where, where, where classical relations were, were recovered using you know, probability in, in, in all of Yilin's, walk, uh, Yilin's work of the past uh, few years uh, with, uh, you know, with co-authors uh, and recently Frédéric uh, Viglund. And so here's another instance where we, we recover something which is not an obvious relation, even you know, this classical relation from the probability theory. But uh, nonetheless, okay, this thing was proved uh, uh, nearly 20 years ago now by, by Tajan and, and Zokhaf. Okay, so I'm not going to go into the proof of this theorem. Uh, I'm, I'm, since I only have, okay, I don't know, I have 20 minutes left, but rather than, you know, describing how we do uh, the large deviation principle, uh, how, how, how we derive it, what are our techniques, I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus on open problems that I think, uh, well, someone should settle. Uh, and as I said, I, I'm not sure that it's, you know, uh, overwhelmingly difficult, but it's something that we, we didn't, which was not completely obvious to us when we did this work uh, with Hubert and, and, and Rémy. Okay, so let me go to the open problems. Um, so remember when, so I, if I, so in, in, in our paper uh, of 2014, we, we gave a rigorous definition to the path integral. And in particular, we gave a rigorous probabilistic definition of the law of the Liouville field if I reweight my path integral by, by exponentials of uh, chi i over gamma or alpha i, phi taken at point z i. So this is putting marked points on my surface. And so we saw that, that roughly, that, so the law is given by, so my Gaussian free field plus my log singularities around the point z i. And I have to take out minus log z zero and reweight by, uh, Z zero to some power. And remember Z zero is integrating the full Riemann sphere by the exponential of the free field. Okay. And when I do this, I can remember there was a, a plus log Xi in fact, in our definition, but if I condition, so this was the, the gave the, the law of the area of my quantum surface. Okay. But if I condition my area to be one, I get rid of this uh, uh, random variable, uh, this, uh, gamma distributed random variable, and I end up with just setting log psi to one. So I have a definition of my Liouville field with marked points at the zi. And when I condition the area of my quantum manifold, if you want, by one, I condition the total area to be one. And I get this thing here. Now, this thing has an advantage is that now it exists under the extended Seiberg bounds. And what is the extended Seiberg bounds? It's this condition here. So remember, uh, Q is gamma over two plus two over gamma. And if my chi i satisfy this condition that Q minus the sum of my chi i's over two gamma is smaller than two over gamma and the minimum of all the Q minus chi i over gammas. So you can see that if I, this condition is satisfied, this, this Z zero variable is uh, to this power exists, it's finite. So I can reweight total space by this term and, and this probability, the law of the Liouville field with condition to have a total area one is well-defined object, okay? <clears throat> and so, well, one can see that you can, you can push, uh, now you can have these, these conditions can be compatible with chi i's whose sum is smaller than four. Okay, and one thing that should be true is that if I take my Liouville field under this law and I take out say the, okay, the, the tensor term uh, with the uh, log G, uh, this is the, the metric on the sphere, you know, four uh, one over one plus Z squared to the square. If I take out my log singularities and, and, and log of, of Z zero, well, this field should satisfy a large deviation principle with this rate function here. Okay, so gradient square term plus sum, sum of chi i is minus four log and uh, integral of exponential h plus uh, the log singularity. So you see this, this, this large deviation functional 
when some of Rukai is smaller than four, it's kind of, you see it's starting to be a bit nasty because you have uh, this convex term, but you're adding, so this is negative now. And so you should have a large deviation principle, but with a function which is not going to be convex. And so, uh, but we believe that, okay, it should, uh, okay, for appropriate chi i's, uh, we should get that, uh, and, and which satisfy certain conditions, uh, we should have a large deviation principle also in that case. And, uh, and also this thing will have a unique minimum and it's given by, by, by this, uh, this, this H which satisfies Laplacian equals this equation. And now you see that it's a positive curvature uh, metric, which, uh, which you get in the limit. So we, uh, so, I mean, somehow it's, it's, it's a, it's a non-trivial shift in paradigma. I mean, uh, we essentially, we recovered uh, hyperbolic metrics uh, with uh, what is called the Cyborg bounds. And with the extended Cyborg bounds, we can work with quantum versions of positive curvature metrics. And, uh, and one should be able to recover these positive curvature metrics in the semi-classical limit, but we, uh, okay, our, our techniques don't adapt to this situation, which is, you see, there's going to be a complication because of already the rate function is, is starting to look a bit more, uh, you know, messy. Uh, because now you're adding a, a gradient square term and a, and a negative part here. Okay. and. But, and also the same kind of picture should work in the quantum sphere. We know since uh, the work of, um, so the, the Duplantier Miller Sheffield paper, uh, Mating of Trees, uh, we know uh, how to construct now a surface with two marked points. And it's what is called the quantum sphere. So let me recall this definition. So if I take alpha and gamma over two, Q, so Q remembers gamma over two plus two over gamma. If I take two independent Brownian motions with negative drift alpha minus Q and condition to stay negative. So this is going to be the radial part of my, my, my Uville field if you want. And I take a lateral noise. So now I'm working in the cylinder. So I mapped the Riemann sphere to the cylinder because uh, uh, the, the Riemann sphere is nothing but the cylinder uh, uh, R, uh, times uh, zero to pi. So I, I construct the lateral noise on my cylinder, which is a, a log correlated field with this covariance. I can take the exponential using, you know, uh, standard renormalization techniques. So a Gaussian multiplicative chaos. Okay, and then I can construct what is called uh, the alpha, the unit volume alpha quantum sphere. So it's the measure defined on the cylinder. So I see my Riemann sphere as the cylinder. And it's what? Well, it's the law of my random volume form. It's going to be exponential of this two-sided drifted Brown in motion condition to be negative. Plus, uh, so the exponential of that plus the my lateral noise measure. And so to get something of unit volume, I divide by total mass of my random measure. And since I'm working with a potential, I get, I have to reweight probability space by, you know, this total mass random term to the power two over gamma Q minus alpha. And finally, I divide this, uh, if I take F equals one, if I want to get a probability measure on the left-hand side, if I want a total mass one, I have to divide by the average of my total mass rho alpha, rho alpha to this power here. So this is, uh, this is how, this is um, a kind of a explicit description of what is called the unit volume alpha quantum sphere, which was introduced by Duplantier Miller Sheffield. Now, uh, the funny story is that the first time I, I wrote this expression uh, in front of Scott uh, in his office, he, he didn't recognize his quantum sphere, but after lots of debate, uh, lots of arguing and, and paper also by by Sheen, uh, Johan, and 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 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Jung, we know that this is uh, a an accurate description of what is introduced in the mating of the trees paper. Okay, so in the mating of trees paper, the the unit volume quantum sphere, he only introduced it for alpha equal gamma. Okay, 
So you put alpha equal gamma everywhere and you get the unit volume quantum sphere and you can straight kind of straightforwardly generalize this to any alpha between gamma over two and, and Q. You can construct an alpha quantum sphere. Now, uh, what should be true, I, I would be, think it would be nice if someone proved this, is that, so what, what happens when you look at your, the unit volume quantum sphere and you scale alpha like chi over gamma and you make gamma go to zero, well, uh, it should converge to uh, the following positive curvature metric with a, a singularity uh, at zero at an, an infinity of, with uh, strength chi. And so it's kind of, uh, so it should converge the quantum sphere to this metric here for an appropriate lambda and how do you choose your lambda? Well, there's a unique lambda here, which will ensure that this thing has total mass one. So you, you have the unit volume alpha quantum sphere. It has to converge to something that's going to have a metric whose volume is going to be one. And so there's a unique lambda that makes such a thing happen with this in, in this expression. Okay. And so in particular, if you take the quantum sphere, you're taking alpha equals gamma. And this corresponds to chi equals zero here. And you see that for chi equals zero, uh, so the quantum sphere uh, with alpha equal gamma, which is, it should converge to the round metric in the sphere. Okay, uh, renormalized to have a uh, volume one. Okay, so this is something that we, we didn't do. <clears throat> and also there should be a, a, a central limit theorem and, uh, and a large deviation principle uh, associated to, the, to this convergence. Okay, and so essentially what makes things a bit, okay, let me say one word on, on what is the problem is that, okay, when, when you work in the case of Uville, you have, you have to study a Gaussian free field, but you, you especially have to, try to understand the asymptotics of the exponential of the Gaussian free field to this power here. Now, if sum of chi i is bigger than four, this power is negative. Uh, and, and so you're kind of safe. Uh, but when some of the chi i is smaller than four, this power here is positive. And so you have to control the exponential of the free field to some power, which is going to infinity. Uh, and, and we know that since the exponential of the free field has only a finite number, uh, can only be, uh, it, 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 can, it, it can only, it only has a finite number of moments. It's, it's a bit tricky to study the exponential of the free field to, to a positive power, which is, which is increasing when gamma goes to zero. Whereas it's more easy to control what happens when it's to some negative power, which is, is decreasing to minus infinity. Okay, so, I mean, I roughly summarized a bit, you know, the classical story than what we, what we actually proved rigorously and, and uh, I, I gave you a few OPA problems which were not treated in our work. And, and, and so I think I'm going to, to stop now and just by saying, okay, what, what's open is that uh, all these positive curvature cases, I mean, when some of the chi i's is smaller than four, well, semi-classical limit where you recover, you know, these positive curvature metrics has not been proved yet as far as I know. So, um, also, I would like to mention that uh, one can also get uh, some, 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 some nice relation on the Liouville action uh, by taking the semi-classical limit and looking at the other degenerate field. You know, there's a duality in, in conformal field theory is that there's two degenerate fields which are kind of dual, just like, you know, and I think that's what uh, led Duplantier actually to conjecture the duality for SLE. So what's behind this is the same kind of duality you get in, 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 in SLE, you know, kappa and 16 over kappa. And so there's also another VPZ equation for this dual field and, and you can, and it gives you some kind of uh, Hamilton Jacobi type equation. Uh, this is something I think we can, we can derive, but we didn't really look at this, uh, this, this point. And finally, okay, uh, I think, maybe that uh, one can, can look for by, by coupling, say, CLEs to, to Liouville gravity, one can, along the lines which, were, which have already been, 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 been done by Viktun and Wong in certain papers, one should be able to 
maybe derive a classical relations uh, involving the the Liouville equation in relation the Liouville action in relation with curves uh, coming out of the CLEs and and maybe you know find interesting stuff in, in classical geometry and so this is something uh, well, I think I hope people will will look into uh, like you know like Frédéric and, and Yelin recently did uh, uh, um, uh, a few works in this direction okay I'm done Thank you very much. So let me start the recording now and then we start the